This is Palm Sunday. This is the beginning of the holiest week in all of Christianity. And we just read a very famous section of scripture. How many have been to a Palm Sunday service or heard that section of scripture before or read it yourself? Really? That's only about like one quarter of the room. It should be just about everybody because I I know you've been here for a long time. One of the difficulties that any teaching pastor has when they, they come on the high holy days of ours, and today marks the beginning of the high holy week, one of the problems is we, we look at the scriptures that talk about that. You've all heard them before. You've heard numerous messages on them before. You may have read the passage yourself numerous times before, and it's always a, a challenge to come with something that maybe you haven't thought about before or a new angle or a different way of thinking about it, and today will be no different. What I would like to do today is I would like to explain all of the backstory and the stuff that you don't normally think about that will make Palm Sunday make more sense. Is that a deal? Nod your heads or we're going to be here till 1.30. Good. All right. Have you ever had the experience where you were really looking forward to something? Maybe it was um, someone in your family was getting married. Maybe it was someone in your family graduating from college. Maybe it was the the fabulous vacation that you scrimped and saved to do that was a bucket list thing. You really, really look forward to it. And you look forward to it for a long time. And then as you get right, as you got right up on it or into it, it all went sideways. And everything seemed to fall apart. Maybe you had a daughter in college who was a superstar and she was a 4.0 grade point and she got to her junior year and she had her career picked out and it was the one she had always wanted to do since she was a little girl and you and your spouse encouraged that and put everything in front of her so that she could thrive and she's thriving in college and she picks up the phone at the end of her junior year and says mom dad I met a guy I'm dropping out of college we're going to get married Everything you thought and worked toward suddenly is up in smoke, isn't it? Maybe it's the vacation that you scrimped and saved for for a long time that was one of those things that you always wanted to to do. This happened to my wife Kathy and I. We had always wanted to go to Hawaii. How many have ever been there? Wow, that's a lot more than I thought. You, You did better than we did. We were finally able to get there about eight years ago because my wife worked hard and earned the trip through the company she works for. So they paid for our plane fare and they paid to put us up when when we were there and we took a boat ride, a big boat, and we went around to all the islands and visited and it was a real bucket list thing. My, My father's people are all naval aviators and some of them were stationed at Pearl Harbor, although not on December the 8th of 1941 but they were there through that wartime. And I wanted to go to Ford Island and I wanted to see all of this. So we get on an airplane, we fly all the way over there, we land in Honolulu, we board a cruise ship and we go from island to island looking at things. And here's what happened. There was a once in a 100 year typhoon and storm that came through that whole week. And we could hardly do anything on any of the islands because of all the flooding and all the torrential winds and my bride laying in our stateroom turning various shades of green that I had never seen before and the ship rocking and all over the place and it wasn't at all the vacation that we thought it was going to be it all went sideways have you ever been there with anything like that with with your life You, you ever been there where you were really looking forward to something and it all went bad. Ray, if, if we could have that first screen. And while he's searching for it, if, if anything goes wrong with uh, whatever is going on with the screens, I printed it out, so I'll just hold it up here so you can see it. <laughs> the title of my sermon today is Finally, God's promise fulfilled, finally. And then it all went bad. 
Jesus himself knows what this feels like to be looking forward to something for such a long time. But the real truth is all of the people in Israel who became Jesus' followers and all those people in Jerusalem throwing the biggest party that Jerusalem had ever seen probably, tens of thousands of people lining the streets, throwing their cloaks down so that this little donkey that Jesus was walking on wouldn't have to stumble or, or give him a rough ride, and the palm fronds, and, and all, all of the noise, and all of the yelling, and all of the… this happened to them. And it was much worse than anything that I've ever faced or probably you've ever faced. We look forward to something, and then we get disappointed because it doesn't turn out right, or something else goes wrong, or maybe it goes really wrong, and, and there's a hospital stay, or God forbid, there's a funeral service when it goes that wrong. But we have all lived this, and this is the most spectacular time of it all going wrong. Let me set this stage first. The build-up to this whole thing is actually not the greatest block party that Jerusalem has ever seen. The build-up for the moment comes a few chapters before. It comes in Luke chapter 13. And so, Ray, if you put that up. This is from Luke chapter 13, if you want to look it up in in your Bibles. And we're going to be reading uh, verse 22 and then some other verses. Jesus is rolling along in his ministry by now. He's not new. He's not unknown. He is increasingly known in the three-year period of time, and we're coming right down to the end of that time. And what you're going to see here is you're going to see that there's actually a change in plan, but not actually a change in plan. I'll explain it. From Luke chapter 13, Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he went always pressing on toward Jerusalem. At that time, some Pharisees said to him, get away from here if you want to live. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Jesus replied, go tell that fox that I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will accomplish my purpose. Yes, today, tomorrow, and the next day I must proceed on my way. He's not talking about his death, burial, and resurrection here. It is a prefigurement. It's kind of a um, ahead of time hint at some other things. But he says, today and tomorrow and the next day, I must proceed on my way. See, most of his ministry was up north. He only came down into Jerusalem a few times. So he's coming back from being up north where where he was raised, by the way, and where most of the disciples, uh, the apostles would come from. And he's on his way to Jerusalem because he knows they don't but he knows this is it. I'm going to Jerusalem, and I won't be able to leave here. He knows what he's been called to do. It's very clear he's obedient to his Father in heaven because the truth is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit got together on this plan before they created any of the worlds. Before the world was ever created, they came up with this plan. I don't think it sounds something like this, but for our sake, it would be like this. God the Father says, let's create a universe. Let's have planets and and big round things floating in space, and they revolve around gravity. Let's invent gravity. So they invent gravity, and they invent the third rock from the sun, ours. And they say, let's make all kinds of animals on it, every kind that we can think of their creativity is limitless. And so the animal kingdom is, you see some astonishing things there, don't you? And then they said, let's make man and make him in our image and we'll fill his nostrils with our very breath and energy of life. And they will be created in our image. And somebody else in the Godhead says, "Um, Father, you know that if we do this, you know they're going to get this all wrong you know it's all going to go sideways because we're thinking of giving them free will and choice to choose between good and evil. And you know it's all going to go bad. And the father looks at his son and the Holy Spirit, and he says, "Um, yeah, it's going to go bad. And you, my son, are going to be the one that's going to go there and fix that. And they all looked at each other, and they agreed on the plan. 
So this plan, this holy week that we live in, is no news to the Godhead. It has been completely planned beforehand, and human beings have been trying to guess at it from the time of the first family, and nobody's got it yet. And they're not going to get it now, really, either, as we're going to, to see. So it's at this moment, at the end of Jesus' ministry, where he's on his way to Jerusalem to fulfill this eons ago plan before the universe was ever created. Today and tomorrow and the next day, I must proceed on my way, for it wouldn't do for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. And then here's one of the most tortured laments, most tortured prayer that you ever hear in Scripture. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now, look, your house is abandoned, and you will never see me again until you say, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This happens right before we start this holy week with the palm fronds and the cloaks in the street and all the shouting and all the celebrating. This is what happens. And here is what's going on theologically. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit knew that the honest offer of the kingdom of God starting right then could have happened, except that he came to his own people and by and large his people rejected him. So this honest offer of the kingdom starting right now, where he would be recognized as the Messiah and institute God's kingdom on earth, it was an honest offer. They knew that the people would reject the very Messiah that was going to kick that all off. Now the real plan comes into play. This is not plan B. This was always plan A, that we would start with a big block party celebration in Jerusalem, and it would end up with a death hanging on a cross. That was always the real plan. But there was an offer before then, basically, where if they had wildly accepted him, everybody, Pharisees, Sadducees, all of the Sanhedrin, the ruling class, all the people, God's kingdom could have been instituted as we are looking forward for it to happen. It could have been instituted right then, but it wasn't because the Trinity knew how it had to go. So here's our scene. We are at a point where a lot of the country has now believed that he's a lot more than just a prophet. He is something really special, and a lot of those people believe that it's the very Messiah. Not everybody, but a lot of people. The disciples are convinced of it. They've known for long months now that this really is the Messiah. They were in close. They, they got to see things that only the Messiah could do or fulfill. Gradually, the word is getting out over his three-plus years ministry, and at this point in his ministry, the word is out. This is somebody really different. This isn't just a prophet. This isn't just like anybody else. We think this is the very Messiah. Now, you and I can't possibly understand all the baggage and the freight that comes with that, with what I just said. These people have been waiting not dozens of years, not hundreds of years, not thousands of years. They've been waiting for millennia. Since the first family, they've been waiting for this promised Messiah to appear. They have been waiting and waiting. It was the custom of Jewish girls when they came of age and they got married. It was customary for them to pray a prayer asking that they could be the one who would be the mother of the Messiah. That was a customary prayer. Did you know that? Everybody in Israel from ancient times to this time right now has been looking for this Messiah and waiting and hoping. And they've had false messiahs before. They got their hopes up and then they were dashed. Some insurrectionist would come along or, or somebody trying to foment a rebellion and people would think, aha, we've elected the right guy in office. He's going to make everything right. And then their hopes would be dashed. Now we come to this point and a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people have come to understand, wow, 
this really is the Messiah. And on this day that we celebrate, they throw a big party as he's coming into town. They don't know for the last time. They're throwing this huge party. There's an explosion of celebration that's thousands of years of buildup. And they are happy. They are happy beyond belief. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the ruling class of Israel, they now know, they don't agree that he's the Messiah, but they now know that he's claimed to be this Messiah. Listen to this. This comes from John chapter 8. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Pharisees replied, you are making these claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Jesus said to them, these claims are valid, even though I make them about myself, for I know where I come from and where I am going, but you don't know this about me. You judge me by human standards, but I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I am not alone. See what he's doing with them? He's tying himself to a greater authority that they do believe in. The Father who sent me is with me. Your own law says that if two people agree about something, their witness is accepted as fact. I am one witness, and my Father who sent me is the other. Ooh, ooh, not leaving much wiggle room for the Pharisees to really know what he's trying to say. And now he's got a giant bullseye painted on him. Where is your father, they said. They're toying with him. Jesus answered, since you don't know who I am, you don't know who my father is. If you knew me, you would also know my father. I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. I am is the personal name of God. When we say Yahweh in Hebrew, that means I am. And only God can claim to be present, the I am. He doesn't say I was. He doesn't say I was and I will be. Any time that God is thought about, he is I am in that moment. And Jesus right here identifies this with the Pharisees. There is no doubt left in their mind who he's claiming to be. Now they want him dead. And now they are really upset with this wild party going on in Jerusalem. Tens of thousands of people. Think of it as like the Steelers won the Super Bowl, and there's all these people lining the streets as the parade goes by to the the stadium with all that noise and all that cheering and all of those hopes that have built up over so many thousands of years. This is finally it. He's here. We agree. That's it. We've heard. We, we've seen miracles. He has raised people from the dead, more than one. He's healed sicknesses of people we knew were born that way. We have heard. We have seen. This is it. This is him. What they were looking for in this Messiah was they were looking for a restorer and a revenger. I'm making those words up. They wanted somebody to come and restore the splendor of the kingdom that they had a thousand years before with Solomon and with King David. They wanted their country restored because for 700 years they've been living under the boot heel of somebody, the Assyrians, the Medes and Persians, the Babylonians, and now Rome. Their country is not their own for 700 years. So not only are they yearning for a Messiah for thousands of years, for the last 700 years, which is something like 20 generations of families, they want this Messiah when he comes to restore the former greatness they once had. Make our country great again. They wanted a restorer. And you know what else they wanted? They wanted a revenger. They wanted somebody to come and off with all of their heads. Anybody who's tried to hurt us or put their boot heel on us or make them pay their tax to their pagan gods or make us do things we didn't want to do, off with their heads. We need a Messiah who will do that. And all of this is wrapped up in this wildly explosive celebration 
on Palm Sunday morning. That was what they wanted. Instead, what they got was they got a rescuer and a redeemer. Not a restorer and a revenger, but they got a rescuer and a redeemer. They didn't see that coming. They didn't see that coming at all. And after this, while they're having this wild celebration, tens of thousands of people, lots of noise, lots of celebrating, probably parties and food and the declarations out yelling out loud, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. The day is finally here. How could they know that five days later it would all go bad? In five days, the hopes of thousands of years, of hundreds and hundreds of generations of Jewish people would all be smashed flat. In five days, they would be battered down and feeling there is no future. Five days from this big party, they would kill him because they didn't understand that he didn't come to be a restorer and a revenger. He came to be a rescuer and a redeemer. Oh, they would come to figure it out after that awful Friday where they were scattered and hopeless and despondent. Can you imagine? I mean, Kathy and I were not happy to have the trip of a lifetime to Hawaii be ruined by a storm of a century. We weren't really happy with that. We, we got over it, by the way. We still have pictures. All the pictures are bleak and rain's coming down, and she's green. And when she was in the cabin being green, I'm up on top of the deck when they closed it off, no swimming pools, and I'm up there, and I'm on the railing, and I'm yelling into the wind because the ship is all over the place. This is great. Um, meanwhile, my poor bride is down in the stateroom turning green. Their disappointment, their brokenheartedness, their their utter smashed flat condition we can't really relate to, but that's really Palm Sunday. It's not just the explosive giant big celebration like a Steelers parade going down to the, the stadium after a Super Bowl win. It's as big as that or bigger, and in five days later, they are smashed flat. They are smashed flat. And none of us ever really thinks about this. A, a whole nation that so looks forward to this for so many generations, and they are smashed flat. God, we thought this was it. We thought, finally, finally. And then it all went bad. Well, it was always God's plan. It didn't go bad for the Trinity. This is what they had planned. It probably grieved God's heart to have this big celebration and watch them become so despondent. So wait a little while. And after that awful Friday afternoon, when they killed him and they put him in a grave, in three days, he comes back to life under his own power. And now these smashed, flat, despondent, hiding in their homes people are coming back out and they're hardly daring to believe that he could be alive. They've just been taken from the mountaintop to the deepest valley within a week, and now two ladies are telling us they saw him alive. And then a little while later, a couple of the disciples go into the tomb, and it's empty. And not too long after that, he's, he appears to the disciples after first appearing to the women. And word starts to spread. And eventually, in the next 40 days, he is seen, Jesus, the alive Jesus, is seen by several hundred people. Several, several hundred people. And from that several hundred people, over the next hundred years, everything would change in the Roman Empire. Everything would change. It started in that first hundred years, and they didn't even have a New Testament. You know what they had? You know what the rocket fuel was? He's alive. We saw him. Or my dad saw him. Or my Aunt Esther saw him. 
Or my brother was there when he walked into the room right through the walls and said, peace be with you. It's not a ghost, it's really me. That was their rocket fuel that he was alive. And they knew him, and they either saw or they heard that he was alive. That was the rocket fuel of the early church. And next week, Pastor Jesse is going to be coming here, and he's going to be sharing in the resurrection that very thing. So for us today, there's a big lesson for us to learn here. There was a gap, wasn't there, between what they wanted and what they got, right? Would, yes, let's not be here till 1.30, yes? There was a gap. There was a huge gap. We have huge gaps like that. We so look forward to something. Usually they're big things or things we think are important, and normally they are. And then something goes very wrong and everything falls apart. I'm old enough now, with grown children now, or in their 40s and with grandchildren, Kathy and I have lived through a number of things where we really look forward to something and it really all went sideways and it all went bad. And we were the ones asking, God, what? what? Are you kidding? And I'll bet you there's people in this room that have lived that same thing. As these people did back then. Only worse than us. So how did they close this gap? How did those people then close this gap? I'm going to point to just a few things here. The first thing that is I'm calling the, the three gap-reducing truths, okay? If you have better titling, you can come up and tell me later, and I'll alter my message for the next time I preach this. The first gap-reducing truth is that God is ever-sovereign Pastor Ron, what, what, why did you say ever sovereign? He's either sovereign or he's not. Well, I'm trying to emphasize the fact that he is ever sovereign. He is always sovereign. He is always sovereign. We look around our world today, look anywhere you'd want. Afghanistan, the Ukraine, our own country, look anywhere you want. And we have to keep reminding ourselves all the time, don't we, that God is ever sovereign? Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 says this, God speaking to Israel. Now, this promise was not made to us. Be very careful when you read the Old Testament. That was written to God's chosen people, Israel. But it's written for all of us. And what we do when we read the Old Testament is we, we glean the principles that we see the promise made to Israel may or may not apply to us, but from the principle we can tell if it is or not. And this is one of those moments. Jeremiah 13 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Now the promise given to Israel was that their country would be put back together. That promise has not been given to us. I don't care who you want to vote for in 2024 or who you voted for in 2020 or 2016. I don't care. We are not called to save our country. We are called to be citizens of this country secondarily, and we are called to be citizens of heaven primarily. Never confuse those two things. The promise we have, though, is not that God will restore our country like he did, he wanted to do for Israel. The promise contained here is that God has plans for all of us, for all of you, for your families, for this church, and for your little corner in Washington Township. This place has exploded over the last 30 years, right? Yes? I mean, we just go down the hill and you've got a whole valley full of every kind of eatery you can possibly think of that exists in this country, and quite a few more that don't. God has brought all these people to your doorstep. And that was no accident. Anybody in here real estate agents that made all that happen? Anybody? Probably not. God did that. God has plans for you. Your next pastor and family will be coming. 
because a lot of you were praying for that very thing, if not all of you. Number two, not only is God ever sovereign, God is ever present. I'm using ever again. He's always present. He is I am. He lives in the moment, any moment. With him, there's no past, there's no future. He is in the moment all the time, no matter what we would call the time period. And he knows your storm. He knows the storm that you're in or that you will be going in, and he is always with you. This is what Hebrews 13 says. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? As we reduce the gap, we're going to have to learn this one too. The third thing we're going to have to learn is that God is ever victorious. See, if if God is completely sovereign all the time, and he is, and if God is always present, and he is, then he has to be ever victorious. His plans always work. He knows the outcome, and he always wins. God always wins. Even when we throw the biggest party you've ever seen for the Messiah coming down the road with the palm fronds and the cloaks and all the singing and all the musical instruments and and all the happiness, and it all goes bad, God is still sovereign. He still gets it. It's still his plan, and he knows the outcome, and he always wins, even when we don't get it. He always wins. I had a professor in Bible college one time in one of our pastoral majors uh, classes who looked at us and said, gentlemen, a lot of people, probably you, think that uh, life is like a, a chess game. I want you to remember this. God always makes the last move. True, right? True. God all, in life, God always has the last move. So God is ever sovereign. God is ever present. God is ever victorious. He knows the outcome, and he always wins. These are the things that the smashed flat generation that lived through Palm Sunday had to figure out. And they did. It took a while. It took a while. But they're the same things we have to figure out. God, our country's going to hell in a wheelbarrow. Please come and rescue us. God says, maybe, but maybe there's a greater good being served for the gospel's sake because you're living through this time. How many here love living in this time? I don't. It's all right if you raise your hands. There's no TV cameras. I don't particularly love living in these times. I have grandchildren, and so do many of you as I look around the room. And I look around the rest of the room, and you have children. And and all of us are worried for our children and our grandchildren, aren't we? But God chose you and I to live in this time. He chose us to be here right now in Washington, PA, in this time, with all of the turmoil, with all of the upside-down-ness that we see, all of the sin going on around us, all of the unrighteousness, even evil, that we're seeing. He chose us to live in this time and in this place. So we're going to have to learn these three things just like they did. And because they knew who Jesus was, and they had either seen with their own eyes or they had heard from people that saw with their own eyes that he was alive, that relationship with the still alive Jesus today was their rocket fuel to change the world. The New Testament wasn't even compiled and written, and all that happened. They had the Hebrew Scriptures, they had that, and they used them, but the New Testament that you and I have wasn't yet written. It would be written over the next 90 years or so, bits and pieces of it. The rocket fuel for them was knowing that this Jesus that had been spiked up and dead on a cross and buried in a tomb came back to life by the very power of God and defeated death, sickness, and blackness. They knew that, and they knew these things. And we're going to have to learn these things too if we're going to live with the disappointments that come from really looking forward to something and having our hopes dashed. We're living in this time period. 
we are going to have to learn these things. And so I'm going to call for our deacons to come forward as we approach the communion table. And I'm going to remind us of this. Guys, just come, come down when, when, as soon as you're ready. <clears throat> We're standing at the beginning of the holiest week in Christianity, and it's appropriate that we celebrate communion even though at this point in our history in Christianity, Jesus has not yet died. And so, as we think of this, I I want you to think about the dashed hopes of people that we're so looking forward to something, thousands of years of yearning, hopes dashed, and then God's plan was implemented, and little by little, they came to understand what it was. And you know what it was? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It was a free gift from God. Jesus paid everything there was to pay on your behalf and mine. If you were the only sinner in the world, Jesus would have come from heaven for you. I'm looking at a room full of sinners, so we know there's more than one. I'm one too. And we needed a Savior. And so this plan that the three of them got together on was enacted. And I want you to think about there are things beyond our understanding like why God would put this kind of a plan in action anyway. And you don't have to figure it out. You just have to, in these quiet moments, thank God that he did. Will you do that with me? We have here elements from a Jewish Passover dinner that they were having that night because they were celebrating what we now call communion. They were celebrating the Jewish Passover. And Jesus took two of the more simple elements on the table, unleavened bread and some wine, and he used them as an object lesson to represent something. And those somethings would be his body and his blood, the body that would shortly be spiked up onto a piece of timber and his blood that would be shed on our behalf. It's an exchange program, his perfect life for your and my imperfect life. His righteousness ex- exchange for our sinfulness. We're celebrating that here today. We'll start by using the, the bread, which Jesus identified as his body. And in this moment, it's a mystical moment. I can't explain how this happens or works, but it's a mystical moment where we become the body of Christ in a way that we can't quite wrap our heads We can't quite figure it out. But in this moment, it's a sacred moment because mystically, we've gathered as the body of Christ here in Washington, PA, and we're celebrating this. So I'm going to ask Jesse if he would pray for the bread. 